Thanks for joining us. Listen in as we read God's Word and see how it applies to our lives today. If this message or our ministry at Living Waters Church has benefited you in any way, we would love to hear from you. You can email us at lwcurexville at gmail.com. God bless. So we are in Genesis chapter 3. We're going to cover the entire chapter, similar to what we did the last week. Uh, We are moving our way along in Genesis. So uh, we'll do as we normally do. I'm going to read through the text and then we'll go through it. We're going to walk our way through this verse by verse and section by section here. So Genesis chapter 3, many times if your Bible is like mine, it'll have a little heading descriptive of what the encompassing topic of the chapter is. And this is what is more commonly known and called as the fall, the fall of mankind. So we'll read, and uh, it's 24 verses, verses 1 through 24, chapter 3. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made, and said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband. Bad stuff right there. All right, and he continues and says, who, uh, who was with her? So where was Adam? He was right there. He was alongside the whole time that it was going down. And it says, and he ate. And we've never been the same since then. Verse 7, continuing. Then the eyes of both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves for themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord amongst the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called the man and said, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he, being God, said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I've commanded you not to eat? And the man said, The woman who you gave me to be with, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. And when the Lord God said to the woman, then the Lord God said to the woman, What is that that you have done? And the woman said, This serpent deceived me, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above the livestock and above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and in dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. And he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Uh, To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing, and in pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Uh, To Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and you have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, uh, you shall not eat of it. Curses the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread. You will return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, and you are dust, and to dust you shall return. And the man called his wife, His wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothed them. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man and at the east... Uh, of the garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way of the tree of life so some interesting stuff's going down right there and uh, we see here in the previous weeks we've been looking at there's God he's the creator of all maker of everything he's created all of creation itself and that includes everything from the mountains to the valleys to the ants to the aardvarks and 
all of us in between. We've looked at some of the orders and the ways and the points that some people interpret Genesis there. Um, we also say that there's some areas where we can have disagreement. Uh, it comes down to, though, what do we do with Jesus? And who is Jesus in light of these things? So then we've also looked at it, you know, hey, naked, naked, naked. Everyone's naked. There's fruit. Um, that's why we get our cobblers and our pies. So, you know, we're, we're you know, pro this, we're pro that, we're pro pie. Uh, we love those kind of things. The meat comes after the fall, after, uh, I'm sorry, after the flood in Genesis chapter 6, we'll see. But uh, we see also that he affirms that we need to be people that take time to rest. We need a Sabbath. That is a command. It's not an opinion. It's not a, well, maybe you should try to do this every now and then. But it's a command given of God for us and for our good. So, the fall in light of this morning, it'll make a whole lot of sense of our lives and what's going on in this crazy world around us. You know, if we don't understand this chapter, chapter 3, we don't understand many times of how we got into this position of sin and death, as well as how we're going to find our way out of it and how we get out of sin and death. So some call this story the story of the original sin. Um, it's kind of okay. We can be, you know, semantical about that, but I think in a more appropriate, accurate way would be saying that this is the story of the first human sin. Uh, because we'll see that in other parts of Scripture, uh, it lines up and it talks about some things that even happened before these chapters of Genesis, and it gives light to previous things that happened in the history of, you know, just God and before the creation of, you know, Earth was happening so even before that we looked at how god created everything and that includes even the spiritual realm you know spirit beings and such of that nature so we see that what ended up happening is that god he creates spirit beings called angels and he also creates physical human beings here on this earth that we looked at now when it comes to these you know spiritual creatures or these spiritual beings we see the angelic beings of the angelic race now, one of them happened to be uh, one by the name of being called Lucifer, a title, uh, not as much a name, but a title named Lucifer, meaning light bearer, uh, which is actually a name and a title that has been thwarted and changed over time because we see that if we look at just the name Lucifer itself, you know, it's not something that should be, you know, thought, ooh, scary, you know, kind of uh, thing, but light bearer, that's something that's good. Um, we see also later on in the New Testament, the Apostle Peter talks about how Jesus Christ is the one who says that um, at his coming and the light of God shall be realized and the great and shining morning star shall arise in your hearts. It's referring to Jesus. So technically, if we look at this title in the strictest sense of its meaning and its terminology, Jesus is the Lucifer or the greatest light bearer. He is the true light bearer. But we see all things that the devil does is he thwarts, he changes. And um, in a sense, it's like he he um, perverts all things that are authentic of God and he creates a counterfeit. So we see that this title then is assumed by the devil or Satan or who we more commonly give that title and associate it with Lucifer, a light bearer to uh, the devil that we come to know as. Now that's because Satan was this uh, great and powerful angel in God's you know, angelic race and in God's angelic creations. But yet we see here that there's rebellion that happens. And according to Ezekiel and Isaiah, we get a little bit of insight here. Prophetic uh, interpretation where it's talking about things that have happened even before creation of us and the earth. And it talks about how there is this angel who said, you know, I will ascend the, the, the hill of the Most High of the Almighty and I will ascend his throne and I shall be as him and I will be greater than him and I'll surpass him. And pride took seed into Satan or Lucifer's heart. And we see here that with that, uh, he didn't want to be with God, which he was, uh, but yet he wanted to be God. And that is the seed of pride. It's the same sin that we follow and you fall into today and that we looked started going towards last week giving hints of 
what we look into this week finally in chapter 3. So all in all, he's not the only one who had a seed of rebellion and pride lurking into his heart. In fact, he ends up convincing a third of the angelic race to follow him, to go along, and that they can actually strive against their very creator God. So we see a third of the angels fell. They were um, demoted. They were kicked out. They were, uh, you know, just cast out from the presence of God and condemned to eternal death and to destruction. Uh, So we see here that that starts out by their first edict of they're being kicked out of heaven, they're being kicked out of the very presence of God, they're condemned, and now they're what we know as demons because demons are angels, but yet they are ones who were once in the presence of God, servants of the Lord, now fallen. And there is a third of the angelic race that are demonic. So we see that this whole great conflict that's going on, um, it's almost like there's this prelog, precursor kind of story to the rest of the story. And this conflict, though, spills out onto the earth, not just in heaven, but it's uh, in you know, the spiritual realms and these things of that nature. But it, it affects us right here, the right now and the past and also the time now and the time that will be to come as long as we are here in this name or this time that we call the church age so until christ comes and returns and sets everything new we are influenced by this whole war that is going on now revelation chapter 12 verse 9 and also in chapter 20 verse 2 talks about how this serpent or as revelation gives it in a pictorial poetic fashion It's speaking in a certain genre, in a certain form. It's speaking in a way that sometimes is literalistic, but primarily revelation is symbolism, okay? Not always to be taken as literal as the rest of the scriptures, but there's truth behind pictures and symbolism given in revelation. And John gets a revelation directly from Jesus Christ himself, and he says in Revelation that there is this serpent or dragon, as Revelation puts it, and he is our enemy. And this is the same serpent or dragon that is spoken of throughout Scripture from the very beginning all the way to the very end in Revelation. So we see here in verse 1, he talks about how the serpent's more crafty than any of the other beasts of the field that the Lord God had made. In 2 Corinthians 2.11, Paul talks about how that this, uh, this enemy of ours, that he has schemes and he has tactics. And if we don't understand how he works, we can be fooled by him and we'll fall into his traps, we'll be ensnared by his ways, and we'll be giving into sin that so tugs at our flesh that we're still bound in, in this life until we are resurrected with Christ and in Christ eternally in our new bodies. So he talks about that, and he talks about how there's schemes and tactics that we need to be aware of and we need to watch out for you know and when we think about this also not to give him more credit than he's due but we've got to bear you know even with each other about this all right and think soberly satan's probably a lot smarter than we give him credit for all right and he's probably actually a lot smarter than we are at times too because think about this he's got a whole lot more experience than we do Um, He's been watching all of us in human history, all of our conduct and the way that mankind acts and reacts, all the way since our first father and mother, Adam and Eve. I mean, that's generations, thousands or millions, however you you want to interpret Genesis in the time span of history, however many years that is, that's at least thousands and thousands and thousands of years of generation after generation after generation watching mankind just kind of smack their head against the brick wall of life, you know? Like, I think that he kind of understands us sometimes better than we do. Um, So he understands us sometimes more and better than we understand ourselves, but yet we see that Satan doesn't come to Adam and Eve in a threatening way. You know, he doesn't show up the way that it was done during the uh, Dark Ages, the Middle Ages, the Puritanic period of human history, where uh, we look at, you know, uh, Looney Tunes and stuff, you know, how's the devil always depicted? He's in this red jumpsuit, you know, with little horns, and he's always got this pitchfork and a little tail with like a spade kind of thing at the end. Um, That was something that was started way back in the Puritanical era. 
uh, the time that uh, the Moravians that are historical and just our very area here in the valley. It was during the heyday of the time of their rising up. What they did was they would um, draw up a cartoonish version and it became what is known as that you know red jumpsuit with the pitchfork and looking goofy and silly. It's because they thought that if they could shame the devil and make him look dumb, then like they're kind of sticking it to the man, you know, and like, hey, glory to God, you know, he'll be ashamed and he won't mess with us. We were making fun of the devil essentially is where that picture comes from. But when it comes down to it, though, we see that, you know, he's not coming at them in this way. He's not showing up, you know, sly and crafty like some like sleazy, you know, immoral used car salesman kind of guy where you're like, something's a little off about that dude. No. Satan comes to Adam and Eve in a way that is not threatening, it's not terrifying, but instead he comes in this way, in this form, in this guise of an animal that was common and well known to them in the garden. All right, Adam has known and he's classified these different animals and creation that are in his area and his vicinity, they're within his you know, reach that God brings to him. So he's like, oh yeah, snake, I remember that. Hey, what's up? You know, I, I gave you a name a little while ago, last week or the other day. You know, like these are not things that are going to throw them off guard. You know, and when it comes down to it, we are in the same world of this spiritual battle where sometimes the devil has schemes and ways that he comes at things with tactics. So the first thing that Satan does, though, is he goes to who, though? He goes to Eve. He goes to the woman, not the man. And he asks what we understand is the first question in human history, at least that we can understand from the text here. And what's the first question that's ever asked? At least what we can see right here, we infer. It's a Bible trivia question. All right? Because uh, verse 1, he says, He, the serpent, said to the woman, Did God actually say, You, can, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? So is that what God told them? No. God said you can eat of any tree, just not this one. And we talked about that last week when God gave that command. God gave that instruction in that edict. He says, just not this one tree. All right? So good parents set rules for good reasons, correct? You know, God's got this one rule. He says, don't eat from this tree because in doing so, you're going to kill yourself. And we looked at that last week. If you missed it, you can check it out online on uh, YouTube and through the Facebook page. You'll find the YouTube and you can listen to the previous weeks. But he says that, you know, don't do this because in doing so, you will end up killing yourself. Your sin makes you stupid. And when you do stupid things, you don't live very long, right? Um, there's, you know, that common term, that joking like phrase, you know, hold my beer and watch me do this. Watch this. You know, it's kind of a similar situation that's going on here. Right. They saying, hey, check this out. I'm going to go do this. It's probably not the smartest thing. I know I've heard people tell me I shouldn't do that, but I'm going to go do it anyway. That's what. And this is essentially eating of this tree and it leads to killing ourselves is the essential knowledge of good and evil. And we talked about how that's experiential knowledge, not just wisdom passed on verbally that says, if I smack my finger with a hammer, you know, that's probably going to hurt. So I'm not going to do it. But I've had experiential knowledge and enough time doing construction and doing things that I've smacked my hand. I've smacked my finger, my thumb with a hammer a few times and. No, it's not good. I experienced it and it's not pleasant, so I try not to do that. Um, and when it comes down to it, we see that some overlook all the good that God gives us. And instead, we tend to focus on the lesser areas that God's restricted. You know, it's similar here because God's given them so much, but yet the one area that they end up focusing and want to go against is the small area that God said, no, this is not good, this is not for you, this is not commanded for your purposes and for your good. But Eve decides to respond and to have a conversation with the serpent, with the snake, when what she really should have done is walk away. And I think we do that a lot of times too, where sin comes crouching, knocking at our door, and instead of just turning and walking and backing away as we're supposed to and how we should, what's the best, most healthiest way for us and those who are in our sphere of influence, we end up flirting and we engage and we end up having a conversation when we need to just shut the door and walk away. Verses 2-3 through three continues and it talks about how the woman said to the servant, may, uh, we may eat of this fruit of the tree, uh, yeah, we may eat of the fruit of the trees 
in the garden, which so far that's true. Ding, 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 give her you know, a door prize. She got that right. Her Bible trivia is good. She's on par. That's what God did say, that you can eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. And then she continues, says in verse 3, But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Oh, she's two for two. That's true. She's on par. That's true. God told her that. And then she continues, says, neither shall you touch it lest you die. Nope, that's wrong. That's not what God said. So she errs and she ends up adding to God's word. And she says right here, it talks about how Eve, you know, she adds to God's word. And it also reminds us that we're not free to add or subtract from God's word or to God's word. You know, maybe she erred. Maybe it wasn't intentional. I mean, I can't read into it what her intentions were. But the thing is, is, um, you know, maybe maybe Adam, you know, being the head of his home, maybe the the head of his 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 spouse right there, he was maybe supposed to teach Eve these commands that God had given him. But Adam dropped the ball, possibly, and maybe he was a lousy Bible teacher. All right. Um, You know, woman, the women who take a husband need to take this into mind though we talked about last week i hammered on the guys dudes just got a lashing from the word and through what i had to say um and we gave some advice to women who would listen too but i hammered on the guys last week but women let me say this also to remind you and encourage you uh, because i'm going to hammer on you next because i'm an equal opportunity offender um, and we're, right here we can see, though, that women who take a husband need to take a husband who knows his Bible, who walks with his God. And we see that Eve uh, had a husband who was lacking in that area, at least in this part of his life, that we get a look and a window into. Verse 4, he says, But the serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely die. Satan directly contradicts God's words because in John 8, 44, Jesus says that Satan is a liar, the father of lies, and that lying is his native tongue. You know, at this point, Adam and Eve have a choice that they can make when they're handling this situation, they're faced with it. Will they believe God and what he has said, or will they disbelieve God and will they not take God at his word? You know, people get hung up on the fruit of the tree and they think that it's all about the fruit to the point where we have this mental image in our head of like the fruit and we think of an apple. Like the word never says that it's an apple. It never says what kind of fruit it is. So we have this infatuation of what it is and we think that it's all about the fruit and it's all about that tree, what's going on, that that's the crux of the whole reason why and where the problem is. But the fruit is nothing but an opportunity to demonstrate faith or unbelief. We all have these trees and these fruit in our own lives, and it's not about the fruit. It's about you and me and how we have our relationship with our God and what we're going to do about this, these opportunities in our lives. So the root of the issue is, do we trust God? Do we take God at his word? And what are we going to do about that? You know, Satan is saying essentially that God lied to you. God's holding out, you know. We see this in different, you know, parts of our lives and, you know, my own life at times and in your own lives and the lives of people that we see and that we know. You know, we rationalize and we hear these kind of lies or we hear these influences and we we wonder, you know, am I going to take this fruit? Am I going to go after it? You know, if you get drunk, that buzz, it's going to feel pretty good for a while. You're going to be in a good spot. It's pretty sweet. But, you know, you're going to answer for it later. You're going to wake up the next day and it's not going to be that great. You, know, you, you want to get frisky and you want to act on sexual urges outside of God's covenant of marriage that we looked at last week. You know, you'll have a good night or a, a pleasurable 15 minutes maybe, but you're not going to be following what God has said and how God has laid out for our good. You know, you want to take advantage of others. You want to get to the top because you deserve to get yours and, you know, you're patiently serving under authority, that kind of lifestyle and doing things that way through ther- servant leadership and, you know, serving under someone else. That's that's for chumps. No, it's I got to get mine. I'm going to climb the ladder. I'm going to be the one who's the CEO, the quickest, most efficient and fastest way possible. Doesn't matter who I step on. That's another way that that is against what God would say. And it's not the best way. That is the way we are taking the fruit. In lives and in our ways today that we do things. Verse 5 continues and he says, For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. You know, Satan fell because of pride. 
And all of this is rooted in pride. All of it. If you just think about it, it's all rooted back in pride. One of the old theologians, uh, Augustine, one of the early church fathers, he said that all sin is birthed in pride. You know, Satan is saying that God is holding you back. He's not giving you the best. He's not giving you all. You know, and pride is a sin. You know, think about this. Pride is a sin. And today in our culture, and our worldview, in the Western culture especially, um, we repackage pride and we give it different wordings and different philosophies and names. And actually, pride is a sin even when it's called self-esteem. All right, now I don't want to you know, say that you have to have this worm mentality about yourself. Woe is me, I'm unworthy. I'm just a horrible person. Like, no, you know, you're pretty bad in sin. You know, the Bible talks about that. But yet there's newness and forgiveness in Christ. There's resurrection. There's new creation, new making of our hearts in Christ. But yet also we see here that sometimes there's this propping ourselves up more highly than we ought to. We looked at last week how... You know, we were made from the dust. We were made with humble beginnings. And the, 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 the word for, you know, human or mankind in the Latin has to do with a root of the word humility or to be humble. So we have humble beginnings from the dust and from the ground, but yet we're given high gifting and high you know, imparting within us because the very breath of God is breathed within us from our humble beginnings. But yet we see here that, you know, pride in the form of self-esteem, it's still sin. And, you know, esteeming ourselves more highly than we ought. And you need to have a healthy self-image and purposes and things like that. But it's finding this balance in this fallen world that we find ourselves in, this perverted culture that we find ourselves in. You know, we live in this culture that tells us that all of our problems can stem from not loving ourselves enough and not having enough self-esteem. Right? You go to the bookstore and there's garbage and trash even in Christian bookstores. All right, because the mentality, if you turn on, you know, Oprah or whoever it is that's, you know, popular in the day, Dr. Phil or whatever, you know, it's this philosophy, the idea even from behind pulpits that says, if you love yourself, you know, things will be better. Think more highly of yourself and you'll be healthier. You know, don't you love yourself? Don't you have any pride? Come on now. You know, psychological self-actualization is one thing that it's called in you know the psychological realm and as you you come to understand you actualize yourself it's pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps you have to realize your own potential you know and realizing your own potential you end up becoming just like satan so i'm not sure that's the route that we want to go you know, that's why we in the Western culture don't see humility as a virtue but we see it as a vice and we see it as you know the trait of chumps or as a means to an ends, and you use it to manipulate people and you be nice at one point and then you turn around when it's beneficial to you and you stab people in the back and you walk over them. That is not what is God's calling for us. That is not virtue, but that is vice. And we need to turn the things around and see humility for what it is. And we need to kick pride out of our homes and out of our own lives. So the great lie is that we will be like God and we will not surely die. When we've already been made in the image and the likeness of God with the access to immortality through God's, the gift of God's, uh, you know, this gift of the tree of life in the context of the garden here with Adam and Eve. You know, and Satan lies to us. He promises to give us what's already been offered to us. Because think about it. He says, you'll be like God. Well, didn't it already occur to them that you were already made in the image and the likeness of God? So you, you've already got the likeness of God. You're, you're made in his very image. But yet we see here that Satan will many times try to promise us what's already been offered to us. And if we take Satan up on his lies, you know, we end up forfeiting. Um, we end up forfeiting every good and every perfect thing that's already been granted to us by God. You know, if God hasn't already provided, then, you know, the whole th thought process sometimes is, well, then I'll go get it myself. You know, think about it, especially when we're talking about relationships and marriage here, because it's in the context of what we're going through. This is why we go expository, because I'm not ringing people's bells, calling people out. It's just, it's where we're at in the text. 
and it's where the Holy Spirit has written and inspired the text to be written, and it's where the Holy Spirit's leading us in the particular week we happen to fall in this chapter. But it even falls into you know, our relationships with marriage and spouses and finding a mate. You know, some people would think that, uh, you know, you go get it. You go get yours yourself. You know, sometimes that's what the spouse idea. You go get one. Go find one. If God hasn't provided maybe as much money uh, for you that you're content with, then you go get some. You step on whoever it is that you need to attain and, you know, uh, grow up in the food chain and the, the corporate ladder. You know, if maybe God hasn't provided for you an adequate sex life, then, you know, go have some. Go have an illicit relationship. Go have a one-night stand. You know, if God doesn't provide you a high, then go get one. Find a way to use or abuse a substance to feel a way that you want to feel. You know, if you're not content with the timing that God has or hasn't given you something, then you go get it for yourself and you go make it happen. Unless we come to God and we receive through the lens and the understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ, all of our endeavors are going to be temporary and they're going to be fleeting. It's going to be like grasping sand in your hands. The harder you try to grasp it and take hold of it, the more you're going to lose until you're left with nothing. And that is why we have to understand our greatest joy will be found in Christ. And if we find our greatest joy in Christ, we will have all that we need. Even all things that we didn't know that we need. You know, he invites us humbly to trust him. And when he gives us freedom, we need to humbly enjoy it. And when he gives us restriction, he commands us to obey so that we won't die in our sin and end up killing ourselves because he loves us. You know, the whole original sin here that we're talking about, it's to believe that we can make a better God than God is himself. Verse 6, he continues, and he talks about how when the woman saw that the tree was for food, that it was delight to the eyes and to the tree was desired to make one wise. Uh, right here, it's kind of talking, I believe, about what John talks about in the latter part of the New Testament. He says in his epistle, 1 John 2, 6, that this, I believe, is what is talked about in the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. You know, and she, she sees this, and it says that she took of its fruit and ate that's the one thing that God said not to do, and she does it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. So, where was Adam when all this is going down? He's right there. He's right there. You know, what was Adam doing? He was doing nothing. He says and he does nothing at all. You know, this is just... What happened here, but it's also what continues to keep happening. You know, I, I mentioned I'm going to hammer on the women a little bit, but I've got a little, a few more, you know, strikes for us. And I'm talking about myself, too, as a guy. All right. I claim this. This is me right here in the text because I do this. But guys, you know, this is what continues to happen even in our own lives. And we still confirm this, that we do this just like our first father, Adam. You know, every generation of mankind just drives around this cul-de-sac. Like we're trying to go somewhere and we just keep going in circles. We're like a dog chasing our tail. All right? When we do this, Adam saw Satan attack the credibility of God's word first and foremost. He saw Satan attempt to subvert and pervert his family by attacking his wife and taking over the leadership of his family, which God had given him. All right? And he sees him going and attacking his wife, uh, you know, um, uh, consulting in his wife when he should have been consulting in Adam. You know, he sees him attacking the leadership and all this and the structure of his family when Adam wasn't leading his family. And he should have been the one that stepped up to lead. And if the husband doesn't lead, you know, the wife will, right? Is that true? You know, if the husband is in the picture, at least in the context. I will say that and preface it because there are single family homes and that's understandable. There are different situations. But when a husband is in the picture, capable, healthy, and available, and there is present, it is the husband's responsibility to lead. All right? And we can say that that's sexist or not, but that's what the text gives us as an example and follows through the rest of the scriptures here. You know, some women believe that because the man refuses to step in or to step up, that then they will step up to the plate. You know, in different situations, for sin, that's not what I'm talking about. 
I'm talking about capable, available, healthy husbands in the home. And someone would think that if he won't step up, then I will. You know, and that's part of Satan's plan from the very beginning, altering and destroying the structure and the, the you know, hierarchy of the family since Genesis. To invert the authority and the structure of the home is the aim of the devil, seeing as the structures of both the church and the structures of the secular state are built upon the governing bodies of the local family. Whatever that family may look like, that's what they're built upon, because if you don't have people, you don't have the church and you don't have local government. All right. So if you can crack the marital relationship and you can start with the home, if you can get men to be passive and cowardly who sit by idly watching death and destruction just mow through human history, devouring their own households and devouring their own communities, then that would accomplish Satan's will. It's a domino effect. So what then could Eve have done then? You know, because I just tore Adam apart again and I tore myself apart because... Many times I'm a coward, just like my father Adam, and I don't step up to the plate when I should. I own that. And uh, I need to keep owning it because it's something that I don't have, you know, completely mastered, you know, yet. I don't know that I will until, you know, I am received in glory with Jesus. But what then is it that Eve should have done? You know, she should have appealed to the authority over her husband when he was being, you know, a putz and just dropping the ball. She should have called out to the, you know, the, the authority over her husband, which was God. She should have been um, like that movie, War Room, you know. Um, she should have instead, similar situation in that movie. There's the husband who, the husband's a loser for the first, you know, part of the movie, so much of it. And the woman, you know, she doesn't know what to do. She doesn't know how to handle the situation in her family because her, her husband's just dropping the ball with her and with the kids. So she appeals to a higher authority and she takes it to God and she starts praying and she starts just taking it to the Father. And I think that's something that Eve should have done. She should have had her own war room per se. You know, did Adam and Eve get attacked before or after they were married? Here's another interesting point. They got attacked after they were married. You know, that's why another reason we see that marriage is important, but it's costly. It's not something cheap that's entered into. And we sometimes know this, especially, you know, I know many of you, you've had previous marriages and you've gone through that pain. You've gone through those turmoils and you've gone through those confusion. And I don't want to discredit that, but you know from experience some of these things bring forward to be true. That when sin enters in, and you or another person, relationships are broken. And pain, dissolution, and death, even of very relationships themselves, ensue because sin brings death. You know, sometimes people think, though, that, well, I can make it right by getting married, you know, and that'll fix things. You know, it'll, it'll fix it, but the thing is, is that it won't make your situation right or any safer either, actually. You know, some men drive their wife to sin and they try to enable her so she'll keep sinning. That way, they can turn around and they can use their wife's sin as an excuse to go sin themselves. Right? We see Adam did that right here, actually. Because the first thing he does is he passes the blame and he blames Eve, this woman that you gave me. You know, we need to be strong, we need to be biblical, masculine, and courageous men as husbands. Especially as husbands uh, or men who are going to be following Christ and taking up the plow and saying, I'm going to follow Jesus. We need to follow in this form these ways that God has given us, not to be you know, authoritative or to be you know, a, a dim, domineering ruler, but because it's for our good and it's for life and it's for the health of the best of us and for those around us in the way that he has showed us that we should live. And in verse 7, he talks about continuing, the eyes of, the women, uh, of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And the first thing to happen because of sin is that it brings a division between the very first family. And once they were naked without shame, but now they're naked with shame. You know, it's this concept then that falls in because they find that they're now unclothed and there's almost a sense that they say to each other I can't trust you anymore I can't let myself be the most intimate and open with you anymore I can't be vulnerable with you you know I can't allow you to see me or even come close to me as I am you know the whole rest of human history is just fig leaves essentially 
You know, we hide behind cars, we hide behind our status, we hide behind jobs, we hide behind our homes, um, we hide behind our job applications and showing that I'm, you know, proficient in being able to do this, 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 here's my experience, here's history, here's people that I have references that say that I'm efficient and good at doing this. We hide behind all these kind of fig leaves, and guess what, I think this is one of the biggest fig leaves that gets hid behind today too. Faith and religion. Because we can use these kind of things, and especially we can use the church and we can use our faith to create a false intimacy. You know, how do we do that? How are you doing this morning? Oh, I'm so great. God is good. Bless you. But you know what? All the whole while behind us, our home, our marriage, our family, and just our inner you know, turmoil, is just our world is burning down. But God is good. You know, it's all fig leaves. And we need to learn to be able to be open and honest with one another in Christ. And be there for one another, but also remind ourselves that if we're in Christ, and if we're going to serve one another and bear one another's burdens in Christ, someone should be there for us too. And we can be open and honest with one another and be vulnerable. Verse 8 continues on as I try to speed through here. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves in the presence of the Lord uh, from among the in the trees of the garden. You know, my kids, they do the same thing now. They've been walking now for here in this last few weeks and within the last month. And uh, when it comes down to it, you know, you see them doing this. You'll see little kids doing this. Um, You know, they they they're in the other room and uh, they'll be quiet, you know, and uh, you know that when kids are really, really quiet, something's not right. So um, they're essentially in the other room sinning. They're doing something they're not supposed to. And um, they hear me all of a sudden stop what I'm doing. Or they'll hear my wife stop what she's doing. And they hear us, you know. Mom, dad's coming. What do they do? Drop what you're doing. You know, and like they, they start running. Or they, they see you coming and they stop dead. And it's like a deer in the headlights. And you just see them open their hands. They just drop whatever it is. Because they think. If I'm, if I'm not holding it anymore, that means I'm not culpable for anything I just did. You know, we laugh at it. We think that's goofy and it's cute. But this is the same dumb stuff that our first father and mother, Adam and Eve, did. All right? They are there just sinning, and then they hear God coming. They hear him calling, Adam, where are you? And they hide from the all-seeing God that they think can't see through some bark and leaves behind a tree. Right? When we sin, we get dumb. That's just plain and simple. I'm not going to parse my words right there. We get sin. When we sin, we get really stupid. We get dumb. We do stupid stuff. You know, if you don't believe me and you think that's just harsh, turn on the news or watch a few episodes of Cops. You'll see. When you sin, you do dumb stuff. You do really dumb stuff. You know, Adam shouldn't have run from God when he sinned, but instead he should have run to God instead of from God. And it's silly, and we'll laugh. But when we sin, where do we run? Let's apply it to ourselves. You know, when you know that you've stepped in it, proverbially, you know, where do you run? Where is the place and the way that you hide from God? You know, we're just like Adam. We're just like Eve, our first father and mother. You know, um, there's, you know, people that they react in a different ways. Um, you know, you think about it. It's, it's like, you know, the husband who... He, he gets away and he's distant from his wife and he ends up flirting on the job, emotionally becoming, you know, an emotional affair, maybe even a physical affair with another woman. You know, it's, it's like the, maybe the wife who, um, you know, she's, she's on the phone and she ends up harping on her husband or someone else or another woman and they end up just gossiping together. And it's just like, you know, the husband thinks that, well, I'm away from my wife, I'm away, I'm on the job, you know, like God doesn't see this because I'm not in my home. Or it's like the woman who, you know, you're on the phone and someone's gossiping then. Um, you know, it's like, well, you know, God doesn't hear. It's just me and this other person. Guess what? God tapped your phone line. God knows. He, he kind of hears and sees all. Or it's like, you know, the young person who's got, you know, porn that they're hiding under their mattress. Or like the generation changes now because of technology. And it's on, you know, electronic devices or things like that. It's like because I have a password screen lock or encryption or I save it here or there, then, you know, Someone else is going to find it. Surely God's not going to see it. But God sees it all. It doesn't matter where we are, who we are, what stage of life we're doing, or what our context is for our sin. 
we do the same dumb kind of stuff that Adam did. And we try to run in thinking that God will not see it. Verse 9, he says, But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? Why does God go after the husband, Adam, first? I think this is an interesting little point right here. He goes after Adam first because, um, you know, chauvinists would say, people would say like, oh, you know, it's all about men and being your bravado and all these kind of things. Men are superior. Chauvinists would say that God goes after Adam first because man is the most important out of the sexes. That's wrong. But on the other end of the spectrum, a feminist would say that God goes after Adam first because you know, God's a chauvinist and God's sexist. You know, and God prefers men over women. And that's incorrect too. And the scripture doesn't claim that. But it's because God holds men responsible for the conditions of their family. This is important, guys. I hope you hear this. And I hope women, you'll hear this and you'll, you'll you know, take this and maybe pour it into someone else's life too. God holds men responsible for the conditions of your family. You know, who sinned first? Was the, the man who sinned first or was it the woman who sinned first? It was Eve. But who did God call first on it? God called Adam first. He called him out first. Adam is responsible. You know, and we'll shout out and we'll, we'll say, it's not my fault though. Guess what? It doesn't have to be your fault. But you're still responsible and you will give an account for the responsibility of that which God has granted you to be responsible over. You know, and God doesn't let us go. And that's the beauty of it, though, too. I think that it can be painful at times when God holds us to account. But there's a joy and there's a beauty and there's a goodness in it. Because just like Adam, he's pursuing us. You know, God could have just left Adam go. Because he let the serpent go. He didn't go chasing after the serpent and say, what are you doing? You know, and just wring his neck and kind of, you know, use him like a lasso and throw him around the garden. No, he lets the serpent go. Let's him do whatever, you know what, who he cares about and who he pursues is Adam. He could have let Adam go. He could have let Adam just keep doing boneheaded dumb stuff. He could have let him keep sinning. But instead he pursues him not to you know, crack his head, not to hold him over the coals and rake him. But he says, Adam, where are you? You know, he, he holds him into account, but he still pursues and God pursues us even in our sin, just like Adam. In verse 10, he says, you know, uh, and I heard the sound of you in the garden, Adam says, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And God said, who told you that you were naked? And this is that moment where Adam's kind of like, oh, oh, yeah, I kind of forgot that I probably shouldn't have said that. You know, and uh, it's kind of like he has this realization that, wait, I wasn't really supposed to know that I was naked. It wasn't different before. So that just shows that something is wrong. I did something I wasn't supposed to because now I have this knowledge. This understanding. So he continues and he asks, Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And Adam, he should have repented right there. That should have been the moment where he's just like, All right, he called me on it. That's true. And he should have repented. But instead, he blames and he tries to justify and he excuses his sin. You know, in the world of philosophy, you call this, uh, you know, well, that's your perspective. That's your, your understanding and how you approach the context of the subject. You know, in politics, you call it spin. You know, but in Genesis, we just call it straight up demonic. Like, that's sinful. <laughs> you, you don't blame shift like that because that's not becoming. That's not godly and that's sinful. It roots in pride and self-preservation. And it should lead to repentance. Verse 12, the, the man said... The woman that you have to, uh, the woman whom you gave to be with me. So, oh my goodness, the gloves come off, all right? And he casts it at the feet of Eve. And he says, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. You know, just that alone, that takes some guts is what I should say. Because um, you remember, this is BC. This is before cups. I'm talking sports cups, all right? Um, you know, God could have really easily given Adam a swift kick below the belt for blame shifting like this, all right? Because God gave Adam Eve and to just 
disrespect God like that. That takes some intestinal fortitude, I guess is one way I could say it. Um, you know, but many times we do this too. All right, we end up blaming those that we are sent to love, and we end up blaming God who sends us to be loved by others. <laughs> Verse 13, God moves on to Eve, though, and this is where it hits the fan for the ladies. I mentioned that I am an equal opportunity offender. I've hammered on the men last week, I hammered on the guys a bit more this week. So, guess what? It's now the female's turn. Verse 13. I'll see if I don't get burned at the stake after this one. All right. God moves on to Eve. And he says, verse 13, Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. You know, it's, it's like she's a modern-day charismatic. You know, you get these excuses that it's like she essentially says, The devil made me do it. All right? Um, you know, Satan doesn't make us do anything. You know, sin is our fault. And we need to own it. No one makes you sin. All right? We deny our sin because of our pride. Guess what? Right back to that, the mother of all sin, pride, that gives birth to all sin. You, know, you think about this, there's many, many examples, but here's just one example, all right? You can say, you get angry, you blow up, and you just fly off the handle, and uh, that little, that fuse lights, and that fuse is short. And what is an excuse that you can come up with? You can say, you made me blow up. Well, if you didn't talk to me like that, I wouldn't have responded like that. If, if, um, you know, if they wouldn't have done this and I wouldn't have had to yell, I wouldn't have had to shout, I wouldn't have had to throw things, you know. It comes down to pride then. We try to push it on to everyone else but ourselves. Now, there are other influences. I'm not going to deny that. There's some people that they do boneheaded sinful stuff and it makes me want to curse and it makes me want to yell and shout and throw stuff. All right. But it comes back. To the man or the woman in the mirror. Verse 14, continuing on here. And the Lord said to the serpent, so here he goes, he's just, he's dealing out, you know, discipline left and right. No one's, you know, gonna be left out, including the serpent. He says, Because you have done this, curse, uh, well, think about that. This curse that is given, it's never to be overturned. There is no redemption for angels, there is no salvation for angels. So there is a curse that is given to the fallen angels here. So he says, Cursed are you above all the livestock and above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and on the dust you shall eat all the days of your life. Now here, this next part, Genesis 3.15, is one of the most beautiful verses in all of Scripture, in all the entire Bible. Because the big theological word for this is called the Proto-Evangelium. And what it talks about here is, what it means is this is the first gospel, or the first proclamation of the gospel. So this is all the way back in Genesis. Way before even the covenant with Abraham, the Old Testament. But we see here that this is the first hint and this is the first picture and illustration where God's pointing ahead to Jesus. And he's pointing ahead to redemption by the blood of the Lamb. And he says right here, he gives a picture all the way back in Genesis. I told you, Jesus is all over this book. And Jesus is right here in the beginning with our first father and mother. He says, Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. And he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Some other translations will say that he shall utterly crush your head even though you shall bruise his heel. So who is God telling this to though, remember? Because I said that you know he handles with the guy, he handles with the dudes, and he turns around and he gives it to, to Eve and he gives her you know, a tongue lash and he holds her against the wall and kind of says, you know, Let's handle this. What's going on here? And he goes through the list with her. But who's he talking to right here? He's addressing the serpent. He's addressing Satan. You know, the first time that the gospel is preached is right here. There's this illusion talking about the gospel, proclaiming forward to Jesus who will come by the seed of the woman, by first Eve, but ultimately Mary. And he talks about here, this is first preached, the first proclamation or speaking of the gospel is told and proclaimed to the devil himself. Not for salvation or redemption, but to set things straight and say, guess what? I'm going to make things new and it's not going to stay like this. And guess who we are in the proclamation of the first gospel? We're bystanders. All right? 
we got our tongue lashing and God's kind of like, you know, got the paddle doing this, you know, kind of thing mom and dad would do and looking at you. And uh, if you've had siblings, you know, you're going down the line, you already got yours and you've heard it and you're standing there and you get to hear the rest of everyone get theirs. That's what's going on. We're bystanders. We're hearing the devil get his per se and saying your days are numbered. And yet we get to hear the proclamation of our salvation, our redemption and our hope given to the very one who thought that he was going to overturn and overrule the plans of God. God is so good, even in Genesis. We see here that we are simply bystanders. We're overhearing this promise that is to us and that will come for us. And even at the very end of our Bibles, in Revelation chapter 14, verse 6, there is the final last time that the, the, the gospel will be proclaimed. And the gospel in Revelation 14 and 6, it says the very last time, the last opportunity that the gospel will be given and proclaimed in the earth, it's going to be shouted out by an angel. So we see that, you know, here we are in the middle of history and we're the ones given the task to share and proclaim the gospel. The first that's given by God that at the very end of history and the very end of time, it's going to be proclaimed by an angel. And right now it's our job to be the ones to proclaim, to share, to tell this very gospel. You, know, you and I were born between the middle of a very great war. Galatians chapter 3, verses 16 through 19, when we went back and when we went through Galatians, talked about how this seed, this offspring, is what Paul was referring to when we read this in Galatians. It's this verse that I referenced in our Galatians series. So this seed will come and will crush the head of the serpent. And in Romans 16, verse 20, Paul says, May the Lord Jesus soon crush Satan under your feet. Referring back to this in hope and in joy and in triumph that we hold as Christians. So verse 16, he says to the woman, God says, so, oh boy, here it goes. He's coming back. He's, it's kind of like, you know, you're on the road trip and mom and dad, you know, they said, don't make me come back there. And then that hand just comes whoosh, 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 you know, and it's not just once. It's like more than once. So, you know, you're going to get it more than once. Um, it's in a sense, God's, you know, making sure he's covering all the bases here. So here he comes he's back on the woman again. He's you know, covering some bases here with her and making sure things are clear and address. He says to the woman, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Women, you know, uh, how's, how's the birthing process? Is that true? <laughs> Is there some pain involved? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Birthing for the woman, you know, um, even before the fall, there was pain involved, just like for men, you know, um, there was work involved and strain and toil. But now, after the fall, and because of sin, it will be multiplied as great pain. And for men, you know, work was toil. We were given work and jobs, but now it becomes great toil. And this is why, you know, our work is cursed, the earth is cursed. And sometimes we get frustrated with, with our work and we find ourselves cursing the work because the work and toil is cursing us back. You know, it's this never-ending process. You know, in the woman, it talks about how there are these things of her and this is cursed in her life. And she is given much more uh, pain in childbearing. And it says here also that the woman's greatest longings, her joys, her pains, but also her very most extreme frustrations will be inextricably tied to two things, her husband and her children. You know, all your, your love, the things that make the most hate out of you, the most jealousy, but also the things that contrive the most joy bubbling out of you. You know, it's going to be tied to two things in women's lives, a spouse, a husband, or your children and your offspring. Am I right? Some of your greatest joys and your greatest pains have come because of those of your children or your husbands. You know, you're going to have a longing that's going to be there for single people you know, maybe it's because you long for a spouse, you long for a husband as a woman. You remember times in your past before you were married where you had that longing. For some women, that longing is going to be because of uh, infertility, uh, which my wife and I, we had to walk through that. You know, and that, that's, that's a pain that you see, and it's, it's genuine, and it happens, and that's a product of the curse and the fall. And for some women... There's a longing and there's a pain that happens as a curse of the fall because there are people who suffer miscarriage. 
You know, these are, these are painful, painful things that have happened in people's lives. And we see that it's because of this in Genesis. You know, women's magazines are plastered all over. You go through the grocery store, and what are they about? Some of the most prominent topics in women's magazines and women's shows. It's about getting, loving, keeping a man, having, holding, raising, and nurturing children. You know, in verse 16, he continues, and he says, Your desire shall be for your husband, and you shall... And, He shall rule over you. You know, this is the same language that's used in the next chapter when we read about the first two sons, Cain and Abel. He talks about how uh, in Cain and Abel, God warns Cain. And he says, sin's desire is for you, but you shall rule over it. This is the same word, same terminology of wishing to rule over the husband. And last week I hammered on the guys, so here we are, you know, we're getting the women. You know, women... Ladies, you're wicked sinners too, (laughs) right? All right, women, they want to dominate and they want to have control. And some, it's because of the need for a sense of security or knowing how things are going to be okay and they're going to go according to plan, you know, and that can be areas where, you know, you want to make sure you can count on things and places and times in life and how they're going to go and how you want, you need them to be done, right? And if... uh, if they will set up the play in many different shapes and forms, um, you know, sometimes women, they'll set up that in many different ways and forms to make sure that things get done, especially if a man will step up to do it. You know, women practice dominance and control, and they start at an early time in their lives, you know, and you start with your fathers when you're little. I mean, my daughter, she's really small, but I can see times when she tries to do that, you know, it's just like she doesn't be as ornery as John is as much, but her daughter, J.L., there's some times where when she does get angry, you know, she tries to turn on that charm and just smile. Give me your big eyes. You know, it's just like that manipulation. It starts really early. It's like, I'm not going to get in trouble now because my daddy loves me. No, you're getting just as much as SWAT and everything as John does. An equal opportunity offender. So you're getting it too. Um, but, you know, you see women, it's, it's ingrained in there. It starts at an early age, right? It starts even with the fathers. And then, um, you know, then it graduates. You get a little older. And then you move up to a junior high boyfriend, maybe you remember, where you know you can be influenced, and uh, he can be influenced, and he's you know uh, he 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 wants a girl, he's got hormones going on, so you know you can kind of bully him, you could pull him around, you can verbally smack him around a little bit, you know, uh, you know, and relationships like those, especially in those ages, you know, here's some wisdom for you, man, Sam, you know, uh, women like that, you know, those are just. Even being in a relationship, like, that's like an internship for hell. Those things aren't fun, right? Uh, just when it comes down to it, like those are not good. And we see there's product of the fall. And then some women, though, what they'll end up doing is, uh, you know, they'll see, you know, nagging that's involved. Well, here, here's, here's a contrast. Let me put the shoe on the other foot. Have you ever seen two men nagging each other? No, that's because one man would kill the other man. It doesn't work like that. But women can do that because you're wired different, right? So what ends up happening then is, you know, no man would do that to another man because you'd kill the other guy. You know, but some women, they'll nag and they'll use this excuse, though. They'll say, well, I'm helping him. He needs help. And we covered that last week. Guys are pretty buffoony, you know, idiots. Uh, Because before you're married, you know, you, you can't match your the right color shoes with the right belt and the right pants and you're wearing blacks with blues and browns with blacks and all different clothing colors and you can't even wash your clothes right let alone you know barely make hamburger helper so we know guys need help that's right there's truth there but how is it addressed how do we do that all right so they'll say i'm just helping him the thought is is he supposed to lead though He's supposed to be stepping up to the plate and being a man that God has made him to be. So then the the idea comes that, you know, I'll make sure I just push him a little bit. I'll get him out there. You know, he just needs some some help. So when it comes down to it, you end up pushing. And then other ladies, they'll, they'll, instead of nagging, they'll use their emotions. You know, it starts with the fireworks, the yelling, the getting really heated and raising your voice and, you know, kind of thing, right? But then if that doesn't work, what's step two? All right? They cry, right? And then the, the phrase comes, why you're crying? Well, it's because you hurt my feelings. How is it that you knew that? It's like you've been reading my notes. 
You know, and that whole phrase, you hurt my feelings, which is really demon speak translation for I win. You know, the conversation or the argument. You know, somewhere between yelling and intimidation and weeping, you know, being this crushed basket case, men end up getting eroded and they get worn down and you end up throwing your hands up as a man. And you say, you know what? I really don't even care anymore because when it comes down to it, you win. Whatever you want, I'm done. Just, I don't even care anymore. Just do what you want. You know, and some women, they're really, really clever. And they'll end up getting with a guy who's just plain dumb and a pushover, all right? Also, some women, they'll use sexuality and physical contact to guilt and manipulate a man, specifically before marriage and sometimes even after marriage. Now, here's how that happens. Yeah, nice. Uh, but yeah, here's how that ends up happening, you know? Um, they'll end up manipulating and using... Uh, because before marriage, you'll guilt the guy, especially when he's trying to be a godly man, and he'll think, okay, well, you know, we got a little too frisky, we should have been doing that, or maybe you end up even having sex before marriage. And then, you know, you're trying to pursue Jesus, and, and then the woman sometimes can manipulate and use and say, you know what, you can't lead this home, you can't lead our family, you can't lead me as a godly man because you're in sin, and you just can't keep it in your pants. I'm going to be blunt, all right? And you can't keep your hands off me. So then the man is guilted and he's manipulated, he's used by the sexuality there. But then also even after marriage, it gets used as a weapon because women will weaponize, you know, sexuality then. And women then will withhold themselves from a man more than what is biblically appropriate. And then they will use it as a way to make a man do or act or say what they want by withholding themselves. So we see here that there are different ways that uh, women can use and manipulate, right? Um, so it just, it kind of goes back to uh, the very last thing I just thought of was, um, you know, women, a lot of times if uh, you, you get the, um, the wrist of the hip move, and especially it's like the nuclear blowing off, it's like that's like the, the KO, but then it's like you nuke them when you get the finger wag with it, right? You get the, the hand of the hip and the finger wag, and it's like every man just has flashbacks of their mother. It's like I'm getting the wooden spoon any minute now. So, like, that's just one of those ways that, you know, if a woman dominates a man, though, let me ask you this. Will you still find the man attractive if you're able to dominate the man? No. Men were made for redemption, all right? You need to redeem your relationships as the head of your home and the head of your family. You need to redeem your homes. You need to redeem your community. Everything is in your sphere of influence. Now, I believe that I need to um, blast through this last part. I think I can do it really quick. We're going kind of long, but I think I can do it as quick as possible here. So 17 through 19, and he said to Adam, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and you've eaten of the tree, and it's not that we're just not supposed to listen to our wives. Uh, Proverbs talks about how the prudent wife is from the Lord. So, men, we need to live our lives following Jesus. As one ear is open to God and we hear from God, and the other ear, we need to keep it open to our wives. And we need to hear from the wisdom and the knowledge of our wives. All right? If our wife speaks against God and his word and his will, then we close our ear to our wife for a time and we keep listening to God. But we keep our ears open to both God and our wife. But in the context of what Adam did, it says, Because you've listened to the voice of your wife and you've eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. And in pain you shall eat of it in all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat of the plants of the field and by the sweat of your face. And you shall eat bread. Until you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, and out of, for you are dust, and to dust you will return. The ground in our very work was once under our very dominion and our control, given to us by God. It's no longer under our dominion, and it's no longer obeying us. And it ends up mocking us, down to the very point of weeds when we mow the lawn. You're mowing the lawn, and we do that through the spring and the summer. Just remember Genesis chapter 3, and the weeds are just dancing. Woo! You know, you just got to keep mowing. They just keep popping up. And another week or two later, there they are again. Woo! You got to go mow it. And if, you know, things are dysfunctional, your wife nags you to go out and do that. You know, and then once again, reminder of Genesis 3. But it's all there. You know, and then when it comes down to it, we pull out our hair in frustration over the world and those that are under our influence and that we're supposed to have, uh, you know, 
influence over it. And because these things and even people in our lives, they don't do what we want. And that's when God ends up reminding us of how he feels about us and our sin. Adam didn't repent and God let creation go into wild disobedience. And now that creation disobeys us to the point where now we remember those times when you're out there mowing those same weeds in that same spot of grass that just kept overgrowing being crazy. That's where you remember Genesis 3 and you say, wow, this must be what God you know, felt like with, with my father and mother Adam. This must be what God feels like with me. Just don't obey at times and we keep acting crazy and just not doing what he calls us to do. So when it comes down to it, these things are things that should remind us and point us to recognize and appreciate the very God that not only has called, called these things and caused them to go into disobedience, but the one who turns it all around and who redeems. Verses 20 to 21, he talks about uh, the man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all the living. And the Lord God made for Adam and, uh, and for his wife skins of uh, garments of skin and he clothed them. You know, other than two married people at home in the context of, you know, the marriage and the covenant of marriage, you know, or little tiny kids at bath time, we shouldn't be naked, right? That's why nudist colonies are kind of weird. And well, not kind of, they are weird. You know, uh, you know God, God gives us this command and this edict right here. And because of sin in lives, we are to be within the confines of the marriage. You know, there's naked. So we're Genesis, you know, hey, pro naked husbands and wives. We're pro, you know, pies and fruit pies and berry cobblers so far of what we've seen in here. So it's good. And uh, we'll keep buzzing along. So we see here that God's the first fashion designer. And since the garments are made of animal skins, this is the first sacrifice in the place of the first sin. This is a foreshadow of the one who will be slain for us then. Verse 22, And then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. You know, we don't need to have an experiential knowledge of sin, like I said last week, and I recovered again this week. You know, uh, some people would say, don't knock it until you tried it. But God wants us to have uh, knowledge of sin by faith and through our trust in what he's told us about it so that we won't have to go experience it ourselves. You know, I think what we see here is that God would rather us sin and die than end up sinning and keep on sinning forever enslaved by sin. You know, it's not that, you know, we would die because God hates us, but it's that He would will that we would die so that in His perfect timing and His plan and redemptive history, He would resurrect these literal physical bodies will be resurrected and they will be brought back to life from the dead. And then for those who are in Christ, he will clean and raise us up new again. In the last two verses, 23 and 24, Therefore the Lord God said to him out of the Garden of Eden, sent him out of the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. We've seen sin enter into the world. We've seen sin enter into the condition of man. We see that Adam is our first father. And even though we did not have influence and we did not cause him to sin, he is our representative. And we bear the nature of sin and then we confirm that by our own choices and our own sin because he has sinned and we receive that from him, our own very and proclivity to sin. And we see that we, as we have received sin by one who we did not cause to sin, we also receive righteousness from the second Adam, Jesus Christ, of whom we did not cause righteousness to come by and we did not earn it from so if you can't, if you think that you're too good and you can't receive sin from one who you did not have an influence over and you, you didn't cause to have it from, then you also will not be able to receive righteousness from one who you did not deserve it from. So we see there that we received a federal headship in Adam, but we also have a headship in Christ, who is the second Adam, if we serve and submit to him and receive forgiveness from sin. Our efforts and our wisdom will not break sin no matter how many times we try, no matter how many government programs or how many ways and philosophies we do it, we will not break sin in human beings. In the second Adam, Jesus comes and we proclaim now this gospel that was given by God, which will once in the end be proclaimed by an angel. But for now, we receive, we understand, and we proclaim this gospel of salvation, freedom from sin, from death, from hell, and the grave, and the very wrath of God in Christ alone. And this morning, we finish this message 
by asking the same question that rings throughout history that was asked to Adam. And God calls out to us and he says, Adam, where are you? Where are you? God calls out to us and he calls out to everyone that we see and everyone that we know. Where are you? And this is where we come now, understanding the life that we know in light of the sin, but also in the hope that we have in the gospel.